When William Temple set out to write Christianity and the Social Order, his objectives were to vindicate the church's right to intervene in economic questions, to show that it had something worthwhile to say, but to indicate clearly where the competence of the church ended. Um, I'm also going to be clear about where I think my own competence ends. I'm acutely aware that, as my colleague uh, Caroline uh, would say, no one has a monopoly on wisdom. Um, I, I think there's a habit often of politicians trying to set themselves up as experts in everything. I really am not. Uh, and of course, very few are. I'm not a theologian, but I want to start by talking about uh, knowledge. Uh, not knowledge, but faith. Uh, a, deep, a deeper knowledge. I am a person of faith, of Christian faith. And for me, the Green Party is the natural expression of my faith. Perhaps as the Labour Party was for William Temple in his day and age. I am a descendant of uh, the Quaker prison reformer Elizabeth Fry, and I believe that Christianity has been responsible for many atrocities and oppression, but it can and should be a force for great good. This is a very interesting time, as you've hinted at, for faith and belief in politics. I've never believed in privileging religion. I'd like to see bishops removed from the House of Lords. I'd like to see disestablishment of the Church of England and an end to the discrimination of religious schools who can select on the basis of faith. But equally, I think that the Christian faith has something very, very important to say. And as someone who longs for the Church of England to be more progressive, I'm very pleased to see the Church affirming transgender people just this week. But I'm also of the view, as G.K. Chesterton said, and I'll paraphrase, that the problem with Christianity is not that it's been tried and found wanting, but wanted and seldom tried. <laughs> the Christian tradition has a wealth of ideas. In the early 1990s, I was working, as has been said, in the House of Commons, and I got a letter across my desk uh, from a guy called George Dent in a Scottish university, and he suggested a year of jubilee uh, in the year 2000, when the debts of the most indebted countries would be written off. And I have to confess, I nearly fell off my chair laughing. No one was talking about it. It was nowhere near the political agenda. No party had signed up to it. But just a few years later, the G8 was sitting around discussing not whether they could cancel the debts of some of the most indebted nations, but whose debts they would cancel. And whether it be the campaign to abolish the transatlantic slave trade, led by William Wilberforce, opposed by some bishops, I might add, or the Christian socialists of the early 19th century, there are some inspirational examples from history that we can and we should draw upon. But I want to add just one thing uh, that's a bit topical. I have been astonished to see the outcry by some who are clearly bordering on racism over the Tesco advert that <coughs> featured a Muslim family and similarly over Greg's for featuring a sausage roll in a crib. <laughs> for me, as a Christian, the things that I get upset about are quite different. I get angry that this so-called Christian country with a so-called Christian Prime Minister would walk by on the other side of the road when there are refugee children sitting, standing, lying at its border. That it would support a Syrian coalition with weapons that is blockading the border in Yemen while tens of thousands of children starve inside that country. And it would weaponize a welfare state, the safety net that we all rely on the Temple worked so hard to establish against those who are mentally ill and disabled. These are the kinds of things that my Bible teaches me to be truly offended by. But let's zoom out, rant over. <laughs> I want to start today by looking at the systems which not only enable uh, things to happen, which, but which give them legitimacy. I'm not sure if it's the same today, but when I studied economics at A-level, we were taught the theory of the firm, we were taught about demand and supply curves, basic monetarism, the control of the money supply through interest rates. There were simple rules which made economics appear like a science, X plus Y, if we were told, equals Z. Economics was presented to us as fact rather than value. Sure, there were theories and hypotheses, as there are in science, but there was little taught in the way of ethics and morality. And of course, underlying it all were values, from the choice about which kind of economic theory that we were being taught through to how decisions impacted the lives of the people we were studying for better 
or for worse. Around that time, Chancellor Norman Lamont made the famous statement that got him into a lot of trouble at the time, saying unemployment was a price worth paying. It was based on his monetarist approach. And such was my indoctrination uh, by the education I had received. I remember thinking to myself, well, you know, of course, he's right. That's self-evident. I don't think like that now. <laughs> but it wasn't until I went to the London School of Economics that I really encountered a different perspective. There I was introduced to social economics, something I didn't even know existed. It was there I realized that every economic system, even uh, approach, is laden with different values. That there are all sorts of alternatives that we aren't taught at school or even taught in universities by politicians or indeed by the mainstream media. And now we see that many of those theories considered orthodoxy at the time simply don't stack up anymore. Austerity is a political choice. We've seen billions created apparently out of thin air pumped into the economy to help the banks through quantitative easing. The longest sustained period of low interest rates. We realize too that growth is a very poor measure of well-being. All bets, frankly, are off. And we are, in many respects, in uncharted economic territory. In many respects, I think Christianity owes a great debt to the heretics. Because in their day, they were prepared to say what was considered unpalatable. They rocked the boat. They spoke the truth. And quite often, what was said as yesterday's heresy became the next day's orthodoxy. I believe that we are seeing that around the perceived orthodoxy of austerity right now. For seven years, my own party made the case that it wasn't necessary and that it would be hugely damaging. Many called us heretics. But we have, I believe, been proved right. That austerity has come at a colossal cost. Just last week, a new study has linked austerity to 120,000 deaths, and that number may rise to 200,000 by 2020. And if we're in uncharted territory economically, we are perhaps just as much so in uncharted territory politically. If we'd been sitting in this room two years ago, few would have predicted where we are today. A misogynist, racist, climate change skeptic sitting in the White House playing nuclear war games over Twitter with North Korea. A referendum on Brexit with a decision to leave. A resurgent extreme right across Europe, an increasingly divided country between rich and poor, young and old, migrant and local, disabled and non-disabled. Perhaps these divisions have been there, it's just that they are now coming to the surface. And in one sense, it isn't surprising, because when the system breaks down, when we have a generation that for the first time in anyone's memory will be worse off than their forebears, then it's no wonder that people look wistfully back to a mythical bygone era when everything seemed so much better, whether that's 1970s socialism or the vision of little England provided by the far right. But at another level, it's very puzzling. What we saw on offer at the general election was not particularly different by historical standards. It was a choice, again, between a right-wing Conservative Party and a Labour Party that had returned to its more traditional position as a social democratic party of the left. The difference in spending proposals was just 48.6 billion a year out of a budget of 780 billion a year. The Conservatives wanted to spend 40% of GDP, Labour wanted to spend 42% of GDP on public spending. Even Angela Merkel's far-right Christian Democrats in Germany wanted to spend a lot more on 44%. Whichever party would have got in, there would have been no plan to cancel student debt. They would not have provided what was needed for the NHS or social care. Corporation tax would still have been the lowest in the G7, despite Labour wanting to raise it. There would be no electoral reform, no end to the subsidies for fossil fuels or the commercial arms trade. Road building would continue, no end to the detention of refugees and asylum seekers, no reinstatement of the NHS or reversal of the academization of our schools. We would still have had the folly of HS2, tried nuclear weapons and the new nuclear power station at Hinckley. There would be no alternative to the desperate pursuit of growth, whichever party would have got in. But if there's one thing that characterizes the rise of the SNP, the surprise move and support for Jeremy Corbyn, or indeed the surge that predated it in my own party, it's a search for hope. 
hope in very, very dark times. There's a thirst for something different, something new. But we don't know quite what it should look like. And that is the challenge. In the referendum, we saw many people project their discontent and hope, a desire for change and control, onto a leave vote. I'll say more about that later. In the same way, many projected their hopes unexpectedly on Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party at the general election, more than I think anyone expected. But today, I want to offer something different, something different in terms of both vision and values, something radical, hopefully, in the tradition of Temple. I often get asked, is the Green Party a party of the left? But the terms of the left, it is, of course. <laughs> but, that, <coughs> but the terms left and right relate to a system that is dying. And we need a new paradigm, a new way of looking at the world. We need to move beyond the purely economic and stop worshipping at its altar and recognise that there is something deeper, something a lot more. And it's something that many religious people have been saying for a very, very long time. One of the great puzzles for economists has been why, when our wealth has tripled in size over the last few decades, when we have so much technological advance, why we aren't any happier. In fact, we are far less happy. What does it profit a person to gain the whole world but to lose their soul? We may be un uncharted territory politically and economically, but what we do know is that we cannot go on as we are, plundering the planet of resources, fueling climate change, perpetuating inequality. It is simply not sustainable. A handful of interests are calling the shots, destroying the world. Tragically, their individual and collective impact exacts an immense negative toll, unraveling the hard-won democracy of citizens whilst mining the natural world to the point where breakdown of our basic life support systems has now become likely. And we know that these same forces are infiltrating our education system, our healthcare, polluting our air, consuming with an insatiable appetite for more, to grow, to commodify everything. And unless things change fundamentally and systemically, it's likely that we will just simply lurch from one tragic crisis to another for time and time to come. In their book, At The Spirit Level, as many here will probably know, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett seek to show how some of the most wealthy societies are also the most unequal. They show that that inequality erodes trust. It increases anxiety and illness. It encourages excessive consumption. It claims that for each of the 11 different health and social problems, such as physical and mental health, drug abuse, obesity, teenage pregnancy, things are significantly worse in more unequal, rich countries. Add to this a growing and aging population, overconsumption, growth based on illusory credit and speculative bubbles, scarce resources and a warming planet. And it's hard to see how we will avoid future economic catastrophes, which will make the last financial crisis look relatively tame. The economic, and for that matter, social trajectory that we are on simply is not sustainable. It's time we put the living world at the heart of what we do. Or as the theologian Walter Wink has put it, we need to challenge the domination system and the idols of that system and take them head on. Every other party is committed to growth as an article of faith, but my party starts from a different point. We believe that an increase in GDP isn't the solution. It isn't just about baking a bigger pie, however more equal you share it out. It's about actually baking a new pie and using new ingredients, to use a cooking metaphor. It isn't an answer because the question, the question that we're asking isn't right. The crucial question we must ask is who is the economy for. We need to put humankind, our well-being, and the natural world back at the center of our politics and our economics. The economy should be our servant, not our master. It should work for us as the mechanism which ensures the needs of everyone are met within the limits of the planet. We should not be cogs in the machine. Last week, the shadow chancellor, quite right, said in his pre-budget speech that a Labour government would put the environment at the very centre of government, promising to have Britain's fiscal, fiscal watchdog forecast the economic impact of climate change. Putting the impact of climate change on the government's balance sheet would be a meaningful step 
towards giving it the political attention it deserves. But we can't simply put a figure on something that is ultimately unquantifiable. And ultimately, we need to acknowledge that our current economic system is not equipped to meet the challenges that we face. We urgently need an economy that sustains our life-giving planet, nurtures people's aspirations, redistributes not just wealth, but the sources of that wealth. We need a fundamental shift of power, where success is measured not in terms of growth, but the quality of the lives that we lead. This government is absolutely obsessed with building big things. From renewing our pointless nuclear weapon system to giving the go-ahead to a new dirty nuclear power station at Hinkley, supporting the expansion of Heathrow to crashing through our countryside with HS2 and churning up the earth through fracking. But these are all symbols of the past and they have no place in a future in which people and planet can really thrive. The truth is that we can't kickstart a renewable energy revolution which would create countless jobs, tackle climate change, and all the while making the UK a world leader in new technology, while sinking subsidies into dirty nuclear power stations and fossil fuels. We can't transform access to public transport with a mega railway that rips through local communities, or clean up our toxic air while expanding airports and roads. The bottom line is that we can't have a healthy economy while remaining addicted to growth and the old ways of thinking. So what would a new economy with people at the centre and in balance with a natural world look like? Almost every day as I travel the country and meet new people in my role, I'm reminded that this future is actually already being written. From the neighbourhoods generating their own solar power to those taking over local pubs as valuable community assets and setting up local produce schemes to give the poorest residents subsidised fresh food. Close to where I live in South London is a brilliant social enterprise called the Library of Things, where you play a small charge, a membership charge, to borrow everything from DIY equipment to kitchenware. Ideas like this cut through the cost of living, giving us more choice, giving us more space. Imagine libraries of things on every high street liberating us all from the need to own. And it's a few miles away from another project, Brixton Solar. There the community invests for a small return, much needed in an era of low interest rates. Solar panels are put on top of housing estates. They generate clean, cheap energy and the profits are put into insulation and tackling fuel poverty. We need to think radically and differently about investing in the future and a future that is already being written by our local communities. We need, too, to create resilient local economies that can withstand the winds of globalisation, with local supply chains, circular economies that keep money in the local community. When a pound is spent at a chain store, the majority leaves the local economy. When it's spent in an independent shop, the majority stays circulating in the local economy. And, of course, the world of work is changing, too much first, faster, certainly, than I've ever known in my own lifetime. In 1930, John Maynard Keynes predicted that improving living standards would eventually see the working week drastically cut to perhaps 15 hours a week. In 1930, with people choosing to have far more leisure as their material needs were satisfied. Well, I'm sure most of you here today are working far longer than that. The rise of automation hasn't meant we spent less time in work. For some, it's meant we take our work home with us in our pockets, while for others, it's meant their specialised roles simply no longer exist. But nobody ever says on their deathbed, I wish I spent more time at the office, <laughs> indeed, on my phone. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that created them. That's why we need to start thinking seriously about real, tangible changes which would readjust the economy into a force which works for people, not against them, like a shorter working week. This would help tackle both unemployment and, crucially now, underemployment by spreading work around, stop workers burning out and boosting our productivity, as well, most importantly, giving people longer with their families and friends in their communities doing what makes them happy. As the father of a disabled child, I know firsthand that there is so much unpaid work that is not recognised by an economic system which only counts money and only counts GDP. And I'm not alone. In the UK, unpaid carers provide £57 billion worth 
of social care, far more than the social care budget. In recent months, we've seen the policy of a universal basic income, long championed by Greens, gain real recognition in a very visible way to meet the challenges we currently face. Pilots of the scheme, which would provide a universal non-means-tested benefit to everyone, have sprung up in places from Scotland to Finland and some states of America. Our current welfare system, something which should and could support all of us, is inflicting misery, poverty and in the worst cases death on those who are struggling. Last week we saw the very real consequences of the government's underfunded, poorly executed universal credit scheme as a letter from a landlord threatening eviction if claimants missed rent deadlines due to delayed benefits. Meanwhile, benefit sanctions place people on work-related benefits who already have to survive on a pittance at very real risk of absolute poverty and sometimes suicide. But imagine not just a real safety net, but a guaranteed, non-means-tested benefit without the spectre of sanctions, which allowed us all to pursue our dreams and exercise our choices, whether that be to care, to set up a small business, to study or change career without fear. That is what a universal basic income seeks to do. By, you, by launching its own universal basic income pilot, the government could explore how Britain could guarantee those opportunities for all of us. With political will, a pilot would see us join those leading from the front when it comes to recognising unpaid work and eliminating the poverty trap. Earlier this month, the Paradise Papers revealed the huge scale of tax avoidance enabled by the offshore empire. We could claim back those taxes lost and create a sovereign wealth fund to pay for the pilot and explore how a basic income could work. We could think too in new ways about uh, securing our housing needs for the future. On any given night, it's estimated that more than 4,000 people are sleeping rough, with this figure likely to be far shy of the reality. Then there are the hidden homeless, people who have no place to call home, but who are in temporary accommodation on the sofas of our spare rooms of friends and relatives. 62% of single homeless people are thought to be hidden away and may not even show up in official figures. Meanwhile, property prices for first-time buyers and rent levels for those who cannot buy remain ever more out of reach. The reason, yes, there's an element of supply and demand, and that's important. But the puzzling thing is that we actually have more rooms per head of population than we've ever had in our history. I'll say that again. We have more rooms per head of population than at any time we've ever had in our history. It's estimated by the ONS that seven in 10 households in England and Wales have at least one spare room, with eight million homes having two or more. Meanwhile, there are thought to be more than 2,000 brownfield sites in London alone that we could build on. It's more than anything the fact that housing has become a commodity, with large subsidies for buy-to-let landlords, which created the speculative bubble. We have forgotten who our housing is supposed to be for. And the homes we need are actually right under our noses. We can remove those subsidies. We can create community land trusts. We can introduce a land value tax and give local authorities power to control, to borrow, and to cap rents. We can invest in a new generation of council homes. With the right political will, we can give everyone the warm and stable shelter they deserve without carving up the green belt. And if we've forgotten who housing is for, we have certainly forgot who education is for. As a father, I fought for a place in my local primary school for my disabled son. It took me two years. But I know the need for an inclusive education that works for everyone. I know too the pressure to perform that's placed on our young people, having just dropped my eldest daughter off at university for the first time this autumn. How time flies. <laughs> At the secondary school where all my children went, uh, an inner city school, two still go there, in Lambeth. When you enter the foyer, you're greeted by a huge great board. And on that board are three concentric circles. And every child's name and picture is on that board. And if they've made three levels of progress, they will be at the centre of that board. If they make no progress, they will be placed on the outside of those circles. Now my two girls were always pretty close to the inside, but my son who's disabled is always right there on the outside. That is no way to run an education system. 
Meanwhile, with my Green Party hat on, teachers tell me of the pressure and strain they are under, workloads bulging and tested themselves at every turn. But I want to tell you another story. I'll deviate from my notes. After my two-year battle to get my son into the local school, uh, they lined up, his uh, class lined up at sports day to run the 100 metres. And I saw his uh, teaching assistant help him in his powered wheelchair up to the start line. I thought, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the starting gun goes, and all the class head on up the track, and there's Samuel, my son, pushing his joystick as hard as he could, far as he could, ahead on his, his chair. And as the penultimate child <laughs> crosses the finishing line, there he is, halfway down the track. <laughs> and uh, all the cheering subsided, and I waited to see what was going to happen. And suddenly someone in, in the crowd, I don't know if it's a parent or a teacher, started to chant his name, Samuel, Samuel. And then the whole school joined in. And they cheered him down that last half of the track across the finishing line. Now, I'm sure there are some parents here. And I'm sure we've all told our children that it's the taking part that matters, not the winning. <laughs> Deep down inside, we all love it <laughs> when our kids win. But I can tell you that at that point, in that school, every single child, every single teacher, Every single parent knew that it was the taking part that mattered, not the winning. We need to put our children at the very centre of our education, every child at the very centre of our education system, and allow them to teach us and allow them to teach one another. We need to recognise the strength in diversity. We need to challenge the one-size-fits-all mentality. In particular, we must challenge that culture of competition, that culture of testing, that culture of league tables that, frankly, is damaging our children. We must challenge head-on the idea that our schools are places to create economic units to compete in a global marketplace. We must put the hopes, the dreams and opportunities of every young person back at the heart of our education system. It is that same culture and values that is damaging our children that are damaging our society and leading to the destruction of, of our environment and the destruction of our planet. The future of education cannot be about turning back the clock to a mythical bygone age. It must be future facing. We must commit to true inclusion, not just pay lip service to it. Not just inclusion of disabled children or children with special educational needs, but the inclusion of every child regardless of ability. We must challenge the narrow, blinkered view of education and the materialistic values that infuse education. Navigate together the huge change, the huge challenges, the huge opportunities that the 21st century brings. To truly put our children at the heart of our education system, we need, therefore, to ask some really, really big questions. What is education for? What makes a good education? What should our young people really be taught? How should they learn? Is it simply about facts and figures? The information we need to get on in the world? Or is it more about flourishing? About sets of skills and experiences that equip us for life, from literacy and numeracy, yes, through to team working and problem solving? I'll tell you one good thing about the school that my children attend, and that's every year they have an international evening. There are over 90 different nationalities at that school. And together, on that international evening, they hear one another's stories. And yep, there are big challenges that come with having that many children from different backgrounds in one school. But you know what? In that diversity is a richer education that you will get in any private school. And there's something more. Something that's difficult to measure and all too often dismissed, when in fact it ought to underpin the entire system. And that's confidence. Not the much lauded sense of entitlement that education ministers seem to set on instilling in all our children in the name of tackling social inequality, but the confidence to be interested in something and know how to find out more. The confidence to make mistakes and know that's not the end of the world. To learn lessons, not just facts. The confidence to be different, to try and not give up when things are difficult, to be open to challenge, to new ideas, to other viewpoints. The confidence to change your mind, and for that to be a sign of strength, not weakness. The confidence to take risks, pursue dreams, find your own path. What's amazing to me is that the debate about education so often becomes one who actually wants lower standards. 
Yet still, our education system isn't especially well designed for getting the best for our children. It's obsessed with measuring academic intelligence while turning a blind eye to other forms of intelligence, like divergent thinking and emotional intelligence. We need a total paradigm shift away from schools as exam factories and instead as places that foster cooperation, creativity and individuals mapping out their own educational experience. So let's take real action that would instantly improve the lives of our children and our teachers. Let's scrap SATs. We don't need to subject our children to high stakes testing. We must refocus our primary and secondary schools away from constant exams and back into independent exploration and a love of learning. Let's abolish Ofsted. We could replace this headache for teachers with a system of local accountability using collaborative assessment of schools working closely with local authorities. Get rid of academies. Multi-academy trusts which administer dozens of schools separated by hundreds of miles across the country. They must have their schools taken back into local authority control, democratically run by the communities in which they are based. And let's put an end to league tables. We don't need them. I'm really glad you mentioned the NHS. <laughs> My dad was a doctor in the Second World War at Normandy and in the Far East. He spent his whole life as a doctor then in the NHS at the Lambeth Hospital and also St Thomas's Hospital. He died a few years ago at Trinity Hospice in Clapham, uh, a place that he had been instrumental in developing and restoring in the late 70s and early 80s. Like many people there at the founding of the NHS, he knew the reason why the NHS was set up. The NHS was born out of a long-held ideal that good health care should be available to all, regardless of wealth. Health care shouldn't be bought and sold. It shouldn't be commodified. It should be publicly funded, publicly provided. It should be free at the point of use. It is simply unacceptable that patients with more money should be able to jump the queue and use NHS facilities ahead of others. And looking back as I grew up in the 70s and 80s, I can see how the vultures of big business were already circling. I remember seeing a, a notepad on my dad's desk at home with a branded logo from a drugs company and the name of a particular drug. As a curious small boy, I asked him what it was. He told me that the drug companies used to give him small branded things like pens and paper to promote the sales of their products. I didn't really understand it at the time. But now I do. It's about the culture of the NHS. The marketization of the NHS has changed what the NHS is about. I'd often go with my dad on Christmas Day to carve the turkey on one of the wards at the hospital. I'm a vegetarian now, by the way. <coughs> I remember getting presents from the nurses. I remember them being places where everyone knew each other's name. You knew matron. They felt safe. Hospitals have never been frightening places for me, as they are for so many people. My dad would come home every day from work and tell me the stories of the patients that he had chatted to, that he knew, whose lives he actually shared in. This was a time to really listen, to treat the whole person, to give people the dignity that they deserved. When there's a market in the NHS, the people who want to tell you their stories become time wasters. When there's a market in healthcare, older people become bed blockers. When there's a drive to cut costs, those with impairments become a drain on resources. And when the NHS is treated as a business, patients become customers and consumers. I believe that there are three things we need to do. We need to resist further marketization and privatization of the NHS. We've seen with successive governments the introduction of the internal market, the purchaser, provider split, foundation trust, GP consortia, the private finance initiative. We've seen clearly which direction everything is heading in. We need to change that direction for the NHS. We need to get rid of those elements that are destroying it. We need an NHS reinstatement bill to put right what has got wrong. We need to repeal the 2020 and the NHS needs to be properly funded. With an ageing population, costs are going to go up in real terms. And we have to be honest about this. But I don't think many people are, at least in terms of the public investment, the scale of the public investment that is going to be required. We know that the NHS is already one of the most efficient healthcare services in the world. We can't squeeze it any tighter. They are squeezing it tight that it itself pressure continues, this incentive will be there to discriminate between patients who are deemed deserving or undeserving, to levy charges and to favour the wealthy. 
But at the end of the day, it is about where our values lie. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can measure a society by where it spends its money. If it values its NHS, it will spend money on the NHS. How do we get then where we want to go? The vision I've laid out today is about putting people first and the natural world back at the centre of what we do. I believe that the route to transformation is a transfer of power and a transfer of power in five particular ways. Firstly, we need to ensure that we empower the good and disempower the bad. We need to make simply the right choices. That is not indiscriminate growth across every sector of the economy, as the other parties want to do, but removing subsidies from the bad and investing in the good. That means no to subsidies for dirty nuclear, for the commercial arms trade, for road building, for fossil fuels. An emphatic yes to investing in renewable energy in local and circular economies. For example, we could reform VAT so those things that are made and produced using renewables or recycled and recyclable resources are given tax incentives and those that are not renewable, those that are plastic, are penalised. Why not just reform VAT in a cost-neutral way? Secondly, we need to empower the sharing economy. There must be a real shift in power down to people, acknowledging that the state and the individual have a role alongside the household and the commons. The future is being written now by communities across the country, whether that be the Library of Things in Brixton or Brixton Solar, whether that be Uber or Airbnb. We can collectively design a future where people work together, accepting the strength that comes from diversity and the need for a society which does more with less. Thirdly, we need to empower people to take back control. We are in a new age of insecurity. The gig economy provides flexibility. Many need and deserve that flexibility. But it also provides new opportunities for exploitation. All the more important in the context of the threat of Brexit, where we stand to lose important protections. We can provide those protections through radical reforms like a basic income, but also with participatory budgeting in local authorities, rethinking people's stake in our public institutions like our schools. Fourthly, we need not just income redistribution, but wealth redistribution. And unless that's accompanied by a shift in power, a change in the way we design our economy, the wealth will just drift back to those who had it before. We know our NHS, our schools, social care and the welfare state need huge investment. The question we must grapple with is where the money will come from. This is actually offering a solution. Yes, as the leak of the Paradise Papers recently highlighted, we need to clamp down on tax avoidance and the industry that fuels it. But that won't even deliver the scale of what we need. We need a proper conversation about wealth and who controls it. And if you want to come back with questions afterwards, we can discuss that, because I think that's a really interesting area. And finally, we need political reform. It's no secret that former Health Secretary Alan Milburn was recruited by PricewaterhouseCoopers to head up its board overseeing its healthcare practice. Overseeing the privatisation of the NHS. The South London Healthcare Trust said PwC uh, the trust paid PwC nearly half a million pounds, ultimately successful, unsuccessful, for advice on how to survive a financial crisis caused in part by crippling PFI debts. You couldn't make it up. <laughs> Those MPs who are receiving donations from Price Waterhouse Coopers, including my own MP, must be challenged. We must address the links between big business and Westminster. And it's no wonder that there is no change when the same firms who advise companies on how to avoid tax have secondments in MPs' offices. When those who fund political parties are those who have their wealth stationed in offshore accounts. When British Aerospace is welcomed with open arms to exhibit at party conferences, and that is at all the party conferences, except the Greens. <laughs> <coughs> we need a fossil-free politics. We need a politics free of vested interests. Where your money is, so your heart will be also. And that also means electoral reform. At present, elections are decided by just a few hundred thousand voters in marginal seats. 
the reason the interests of 11 million disabled people aren't properly represented at Westminster is the same reason why climate change isn't taken seriously. It's because it isn't the thing that convinces those all-important swing voters in those marginal seats. Change the system and you change people's lives. Friends, the challenges are huge. There are no easy answers. But what is at stake is nothing less than our collective future and our collective existence. And the solutions must involve our collective endeavour. Thank you very much. Thank you.